hello everybody and uh, thank you for turning up. I, I'm not totally sure what you're expecting from me, um, but I'll tell you briefly, uh, we're talking about Northern Ireland <clears throat> and uh, I covered the Troubles for the first four years of 1969 to 73 in Northern Ireland as the anchor for the local evening news programme, UTV Reports, that's Ulster Television, Ulster Television Reports, the ITV station in Belfast. The equivalent if you're up here in the northwest of Granada Reports or whatever you've got on your ITV station, whatever region you're looking in from. Um, but I came to uh, Ulster Television, would you believe it, as sports editor, nothing to do with politics or anything heavy. And I was a sports editor appointed in 1967. Uh, and in the end of 1968, uh, the uh, presenter of uh, UTV reports uh, fell out over his contract and his money and stormed off, never to be seen again. And they didn't have anyone to do the program that night. So they looked around and saw me sitting there and said, ah, Gordon, you're the only one who can do a half hour program here because you do the sport, you have a journalistic background, uh, you're going to have to do the show tonight. So I did it for a couple of days, which became a week, which became two weeks, and they said, actually, this is going quite well. Would you like to do it permanently? And little naive old me said, because uh, the troubles hadn't started yet, said, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Um, but I don't really have much to do with politics, so I don't really want to do any politics. And they said, oh, it's very mild stuff. Don't worry about it. You'll cope. Uh, and that was it. At the end of 19, a few weeks later, after I started doing it, into 1969 in January, came Bertollet Bridge, uh, where the People's Democracy March to Derry, campaigning for civil rights and so on, was ambushed uh, on the way by uh, hundreds of uh, hardline Protestant loyalists, if you like, uh, led by the Reverend Ian Paisley, who had amassed a load of stones and bricks and whatever else, and uh, attacked the march. And the IUC, the police force in Northern Ireland at the time, now changed, of course, to the uh, PSNI, um, they were standing by to keep the march safe or whatever, and they stood back more or less and let it happen, um, which was, if there had been any confidence in the IUC from the nationalist uh, community, of which there was little, uh, it had gone out the window now for good. And that was the very start, really, of the troubles. That's when it very began, and it's just uh, its very early flames, um, and grew from there. And so here I was, suddenly in the thick of it, every night politicians coming in as the troubles began to grow. Um, and suddenly within a matter of time, uh, the army were coming in, uh, the British army were coming into Belfast, initially to protect the Catholics from attacks from Protestants. And then that changed, uh, no IRA man was ever gonna let the British army uh, protect the Catholics. And so uh, the IRA set up to protect the Catholic people and the more clashes there were, in uh, riots in the street and so on between the army, the police and, and the nationalist people, uh, the more support uh, in the nationalist community grew for the IRA. And here was I, the man who didn't want to do any politics, suddenly having to wrestle with it every night uh, uh, in, in the studio. But that wasn't a bad thing in a way, getting in at the beginning, uh, because it meant you were in at the start, you followed every night, you knew what was happening and all the politicians, and leaders who were involved in everything that was happening would be coming into our program to do live interviews and up to the green room afterwards. And it was in the green room, there was big Irish politics, but politicians, uh, they were happy to have a, a wee snifter or two uh, and they would uh, drink until the, uh, uh, our cupboard was dry, so to speak. But they would tell you then what was really going on. You learned far more of what was going on behind the scenes and what they couldn't say on telly. Um, uh, and I learned a lot from that. Um, but as the troubles happened and um, the riots uh, built in the streets and then it turned to bomb and bullet, to cover that uh, as a television station uh, had its difficulty. We were feeling our way like everybody else was. We were doing um, interrupting programs at breaking news. A riot had started at the bottom of the uh, Falls Road or whatever. Um, and suddenly we were asked by government and police not to do that because it brought far more people to the scene and we had to decide whether we would follow that or not but in fact uh, we in the end did because it did lead to more serious riots um, but it also meant that um, UTV itself uh, came under threat on many occasions um, and uh, we had to evacuate the building quite frequently 
And in Northern Ireland at that time, uh, if you heard the bell go, you evacuated. You didn't uh, take your chances. There could well be a bomb in the building. Um, so out you went. But in normal circumstances, people would go to the areas designated on the other side of the street far away and wait for the all clear. Uh, UTV and being Ireland, they all went out round the corner into Maxie's pub. Uh, and there they stayed in Maxie's pub. And when the, it was all clear happened, you couldn't get them back in the building to do the programmes. Uh, that's, that's, that's Ireland for you. Uh, I always felt that if they wanted to really take UTV off the air, they should do the bomb threat to uh, UTV and blow up Maxie's pub and then they get everybody in, in the one go. Um, but, but the threats, because they came thick and fast at the end of the programme, if I interviewed a Protestant politician quite hard, as you do, um, then the prods would be all on the phone afterwards uh, threatening. Uh, me threatening the station. If the next night it was a hard time for one of the nationalist leaders, uh, then you got the threats from there. So as long as they came from both sides, I was fairly comfortable with it. And some of them were crazy. I once got a, a death threat, at least it seemed to be, from a alleged Protestant extreme paramilitary group called WE, W-E. And every time WE was written, it was in capital letters. And all I got was a letter to UTV, the ITV station. Uh, to Gordon Burns, we know who you are, capital we, uh, W-E, we know who you are, we know where you live, we know your car, we know your route to work, we know where you work, we are going to get you now. Uh, and they sent it to uh, the BBC in Northern Ireland, not to ITV where uh, I worked. So I thought that was fairly uh, comfortable um, to uh, ignore, if you like. But there was a serious one. It came during the day, um, and we expect it as, as uh, broadcasters on the air, just as politicians do. Um, and it was uh, in, during the day, which is a bit serious, and uh, the way it was worded was serious. Um, and it was reported uh, to the police. Uh, I didn't know about it at the time. And the police rang me and told me about it and said I had to take it seriously. Uh, they then gave me instructions on how to... <clears throat> feel my way around a parcel um, to fire it for wires and various bits and pieces before I would open it in case it was a bomb. They taught me how to look under my car and where to look and where I might more likely find the bomb if it was under the car. They told me I had to change my route to work every day, change the times I went and came home. And you can imagine that was uh, quite scary at the time. And two days after um, that happened, I left my, I was in a third floor flat apartment, call it what you will, with my wife and little boy. And um, I came down the stairs and came out the door and closed it behind me to take him to school. And as I did, a car pulled up on the road across my gateway. And there were two heavy looking guys in anoraks and hoods uh, and that, in a Ford Cortina. And that was always what they used uh, and how they looked. And I thought, right, this is it. Uh, I can't turn and go back in or they'll get me. I don't know what, I can't get my car and go out because they're blocking the way. I didn't know what to do, but I thought maybe I'm imagining it and I decided to walk. I was more worried about my little boy going up to primary school. And I went out, turned the corner to walk up the hill and it came with me at exactly my pace, slowly up the road. I was passing all these hedges at the bottom of people's gardens on one side of me and the car on the other. And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw the guy in the passenger seat wind the window down and I thought, this is it. All right, what do I do? And it's amazing what you think in literally one second. I was thinking, right, this is it. I'm going to dive into the hedge. I'm going to push my son in first. I'm going to go in over the top of him. So hopefully if they get me, they won't get him. Um, and then you think, well, hang on. Supposing I'm in the hedge and the guy says, excuse me, I just wanted to know, do you know where the post office is? And then I'd look really stupid in this hedge, uh, leaves out of my hair. Um, but I decided I'm going for the hedge. I was just about to dive in when it drove off. And I was so shocked I didn't take any notice of the car as it went away. Um, and I decided in the end I was imagining it or whatever. It wasn't really a threat, except the next morning it happened again. Exactly the same thing. Came up the road, wound the window down, and it roared off in the end, uh, leaving me shaking again. But I took the number of the car. And when I got to work, uh, we had a new guy joining us who became very famous in Northern Ireland, a very famous broadcaster on television and radio, but he just joined UTV and was my stand-in as presenter, a guy called David Dunsey. 
and he'd come from the IEC drug squad of all places to join us. Um, and they gave him the number. Um, and he got onto his boys in the uh, Fort police force, his old mates, and they checked the car. And they rang me at four o'clock and said, right, Gordon, we have looked into it and we've sorted it out. Uh, it's all right. I said, what do you mean it's all right? I mean, well, well, where did the car come from? They said, Cuba Street. Cuba Street is in the heart of East Belfast, uh, right in the center of UDA, Protestant paramilitary territory. Uh, Ulster Freedom Fighters, you name it, a very nasty bunch uh, when they wanted to be. Um, and that was very worrying for me. And he said, don't worry about it. We've sorted it. It won't happen again. I said, I don't want to know more. And they said, Gordon, this is all we're going to say to you. We've sorted it. It won't happen again. Now forget it. And I've no idea to this day what it was about. And it never happened again. So that was pretty scary. But... <clears throat> You're a journalist, you do your job like every other journalist who went there. Um, and we were under more uh, threat from the Protestant <coughs> community, excuse me, a great horse, excuse me, from the Protestant community um, who believed they were losing everything and blamed the media for publicizing it. Uh, then the nationalist community, the IRA, were quite happy to have uh, everything on the telly uh, to promote their cause. Um, so we're under more threat from the Protestant community. But also, it led to ugly scenes outside the UTV building. Uh, because UTV, they've moved out recently, but they are in a building on the Ormo Road in Belfast. As you come out of the door to the right of the building, or your left as you're looking at me, but out of the building to the right was a Protestant ghetto. And to the left, the Ormo Road was Catholic ghetto. And so when these tough interviews or discussions were going on in the programme, all the Protestants from the Protestant ghetto would come to one side of the building, and all the nationalists from the national side would come to the other side of the building in order to cheer or jeer the politician they supported or didn't support uh, when they came out. And to amuse themselves in the meantime, they stoned each other. And so you had quite a scene, an ugly scene going on outside. And when the politicians came out, uh, they, they had to be protected before they got away. I'll tell you one interesting story, uh, which says a lot about democracy in this country. Um, and how we should protect it in a strange way. But we had on our program one night the firebrand um, that was Bernadette Devlin, now Bernadette M Makaliski, um, who um, was up and coming as a, a fierce nationalist IRA supporter and so on, made a magnificent maiden speech. I don't know whether Louise was in Parliament when she made it, um, but made a fantastic uh, uh, maiden speech in Parliament, which riveted the whole place as she laid into uh, everybody in the British government. Um, but she was on the programme and she laid into the IEC and laid into the British Army, calling them murdering this, that and the other. Uh, and during this discussion, again, a hard time. So you can imagine what happened outside. Masses of prods came out to get her. <laughs> Catholics uh, gathered to cheer her to the rafters. Um, and they were stoning each other for, for all they were worth. And when we finished the program, Bernadette said she had to go because she had a meeting somewhere that she had to attend. And uh, she was told on no circumstances can you leave the building. We will, the army and the police will have to sort it. So they uh, got Bernadette's car directly outside the front door across the pavement on the road, just opposite the front door. They put an army pig, which is one of those armored cars known as a pig, an army pig in front of her car and an IEC police force pig behind it. So she was sandwiched in the middle to drive her off. And then the army said, get her by the front door inside the building. And when you get the word go, open the door and Bernadette run out across the pavement and into your car and you'll be protected all the way. And what happened was the soldiers and the police lined up from the door to the car, uh, like a guard of honor, if you like. Um, and then as, as we got the word go, and we opened the door, they put their riot shields up into a roof above her head and the bricks came thick and fast through the sky uh, aimed at Bernadette. And these poor soldiers and police that she'd been taking apart in the program uh, with the utmost vitriol uh, were taking these bricks and stones on their back and their legs because their riot shields were up there. Uh, and they made sure she got in the car and went away to safety. And I just thought to myself, 
There we are, that's democracy at work. If that had been France or Italy or somewhere, I doubt whether the police or the RUC or the police or the army would have bothered very much with it. Um, but I find that quite fascinating. And we had many an incident like that outside uh, the uh, building. But then we had the politicians to deal with in the studio. Um, and that was tricky enough uh, because no Irish politician ever wants to stop talking. Mind you, that's much the same with English politicians, but uh, particularly with Irish ones, didn't want to uh, stop talking. Um, and, who, and they're very clever as well, uh, because they knew the floor manager signs in a discussion where if there's one minute to go, the floor manager would give me a sign one minute. When it was half a minute to go, they would go half a minute. And to wind up, you do the wind up, 15 seconds to go. And they watched like a hawk. And once the one minute came up, they wanted to get in there. And if they got in, they weren't going to let anybody else get in to the end of the program so they could have the last word. So it was a nightmare for a presenter like me. And one of the worst culprits was the Reverend Ian Paisley. And the minute I'm going to do a vague impression of him, which will be very vague, but you'll get the idea. But I had him on a discussion this night. It was a horseshoe desk. And I was in the middle of the horseshoe and the politicians around me on either side. Um, and this discussion went on for about 10, 12 minutes about four politicians, maybe five. Um, and I couldn't get Paisley stopped at times, uh, but in the end, I did get him stopped. And uh, so he, at the end of the program, he came out, turned on me, called me Gordon when he was friendly and Mr. Burns uh, when he wasn't being friendly. He turned on me and he said, Mr. Burns. Uh, he said, that was the most biased discussion I've ever been in in all my life. Uh, you gave them far more time than you gave me. Disgraceful, disgusting. I got to complain. Um, and off he stormed into the night. And two days later, he came back to do In fact, I had said to him, I thought it was fairly even. And if anything, Mr. Paisley, I thought you had more time than they had. Rubbish, absolute rubbish. They had far more time than me. He came back in two days later for another interview or whatever. And I bumped into him as I was going to make up. And he turned around. And I'm six foot, but he's big, man. And he grabbed me by the lapels and he pulled me up onto my tippy toes and his big face went straight into my face right in front of me. And he said, the very man, Mr. Burns, which is bad news, it was Mr. Burns. Uh, very, he said, do you remember the other day? I said it was a biased discussion and you gave everybody else more time than me. Um, and I said, well, well yes. Um, and, uh, and you said I had more time than them, didn't you? I said, yes. He said, one of my supporters tape recorded that program. And we put a stopwatch on the contribution of each member of that discussion. And you know what I'm going to tell you, Mr. Buttons, with his eyes bulging. I thought, oh, no, here we go. And he said, you were right. I was wrong. I had more time than anybody else. <laughs> And roared with laughter as he disappeared off to, towards the dressing room himself. Um, so there was a, a lighter side to Mr. Paisley, and there was a darker side with a lighter finish. We were in a discussion again in the studio once, and we invited two politicians from the Republic of Ireland up, which was dangerous stuff in those days. Uh, and Paisley was in the discussion, and he totally disapproved of us having politicians from the Republic up who didn't recognize the constitution of Northern Ireland. Um, but the discussion went on until these two from Dublin kept referring to Northern Ireland as the six counties, which is a red rag to a bull to any hardline Protestant, to people in the six counties, because they believe Ireland is still all one, um, so, or should be. And um, suddenly Paisley leapt to his feet in this discussion, which was the last 12 minutes of the programme, leapt to his feet and said, I'll not stay a minute longer in this studio with people from the Republic who don't recognize the constitution of this country. I am going. You should never have had them here. And he stormed off across the studio and he got to the doors, which he pulled open uh, and he was out of the light. So he was a shadowy figure as the camera found him at the door where he did a bit more. This is outrageous. They should not have been invited and went off into the distance. And you can imagine the discussion then fell flat for the next eight minutes. I don't know how we got through it. Uh, when it was over, we left the studio and I was apologizing to the Dublin politicians for what had happened. Um, when I saw Paisley waiting for us, coming out of the studio, uh, oh no, he's not gonna have a go at the Dubliners and me. 
and he just uh, came walking up and he said, gentlemen, I think I know who won that one. <laughs> uh, and off he went into the night. On another occasion, we riveted the whole country by having a masked man in the studio. Um, you will remember uh, the uh, situation in the bog side in Derry, where they had the no-go area. Uh, I think it was after a shooting incident from the British Army. Uh, they set up the no-go area, not for the first time, but they set up a no-go area, which the IRA set up. Uh, the Derry Brigade led by Martin McGuinness, and they barricaded the whole of uh, the north uh, of Bogside uh, up and would not let the police and the army in. And the Protestant community were leaping up and down, uh, demanding uh, that the army went in and removed the barricades and swept through the Bogside and arrested all the IRA men and so on, which would have ended in massive bloodshed if that had happened. Um, and so in uh, protest, because the army wouldn't go in, the UDA, the Protestant Paramilitary Group, the Ulster Defence Association, um, uh, decided they would do similar and set up a no-go area in a Protestant territory in Belfast at the Springfield Road um, to challenge the British army then. If you're going to let them have a, a, no, a free area, a no-go area, you're going to have to do it for us, um, which is very silly, but that's what they did. So we asked the UDA man, would he be prepared to come in and talk about it? Yes. We then got the MP for uh, the box side, John Hume. Would you like to come in? Uh, and John would never turn down any chance to be in front of a camera. Uh, so he said, absolutely. Uh, and he came in. The UDA man decided he had to be masked in case uh, he became a target for the IRA. So we had this extraordinary scene in the studio of a masked man defending uh, the, the Protestant situation and John Hume uh, defending the Bogside situation. And when they met at, before they came in the studio, we said, uh, John Hume, this is the man from the UDA. And John put his hand out for a handshake. The UDA man slapped it aside and wouldn't touch it, just slapped it, bang, aside. At the end of the uh, discussion, which was riveting, but had the whole Northern Ireland up in arms, uh, about having a masked man on. Um, we went up to the green room, as you do, and um, they started chatting. Um, and then after a while, with much drink, and forgive my language coming up, I'm reporting it as it happened. Uh, the UDA man said, oh, fuck this, and pulled his mask off and threw it on the ground and continued for another 20 minutes, having the best time of his life with John Hume uh, before they disappeared off into the dark. So things go on there behind the scenes uh, that you don't necessarily recognize. Now, I'm aware that my time is probably running out. There's two things I want to mention if I can squeeze them in before I go, but I have, I can see Mary Gregory, our chair, in the corner of the screen. And if you want to wave frantic at me, I'll shut up. John Tong is probably furious that I may be eating into his time. There's two important things I just want to say at the end of this meander through it all. Um, and that is first and foremost, it's not often you get a chance to be a part of history. And not only was the, 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 uh, the Troubles a national story and great history that I was reporting every night, but you get a moment in that which stands out and actually affected the situation in Northern Ireland. <coughs> Excuse me. And that was when the, um, they decided, Stormont had been prorogued, Stormont was over. And in time they decided to, um, have elections under, as I remember, proportional representation to form a new power sharing assembly. Not quite the thing they've got now, but uh, the um, uh, Unionist Party, which is the biggest party in Northern Ireland, would no doubt be the biggest party in the new assembly. And Brian Faulkner, who had been the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, would be the First Minister. And the SDLP would be the second biggest party, uh, the Social Democratic Labour Party of Jerry Fitt and John Hume. And Jerry Fitt, the leader, would be the deputy. That was what it was to be. And the white paper was put before Parliament. It was going to be a two day debate uh, on this new assembly. And so UCB decided they would do the program from uh, London. Um, so that at the end of the first day of the debate and the second day, of the, debate, the politicians that were involved and the journalists who were there could easily get into a studio just down the road a bit um, at ITN Studios, uh, which were different from where they are now. Um, so I did the program that evening and then was rushed to the airport to get the last flight to London to anchor the program from London the next day. 
So I was catching the flight. It was an Alder Grove Airport, Belfast International, heading for the last British Airways flight to London when the tannoy system sounded. Uh, when Mr. Burns come to the phone, I was rushing. I didn't really have time, but I went to the phone and it was my editor, a guy called Robin Walsh. So I change of plan, Gordon. Tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock, Downing Street, interview the Prime Minister, okay? I said, what? Hang on, hang on. The Prime Minister in those days never gave regional interviews ever. They do now. They didn't ever give regional interviews. They certainly weren't going to talk about Northern Ireland. Edward Heath was the Prime Minister, and uh, there was never going to be a chance of talking to him. You were lucky if you ever got the Secretary of State. Um, so I thought he's a hope. I said, Robin, I haven't time for this. You know, I've got to get the play. What? Stop joking. What do you want? He said, I've just told you. 11 o'clock, Prime Minister Dining Street, uh, crew will be there. I said, Robin, stop it. What do you want? He said, I'm telling you. And somehow he had managed to land this exclusive interview with the Prime Minister before the debate was to start on the white paper, which was unbelievable and, and had a parliament up in arms afterwards. Um, so suddenly I was flying to London with a major half hour interview with the Prime Minister and Dining Street. And I have, there's no iPads or phones where I can Google and uh, get my facts together and figures ready to start. Uh, you can't get to a library to get to the Cuttings Library. And I had to sit up for two hours preparing my interview. I went to Downing Street to do it with Ted Heath. And two things happened in that interview. The first of all, the loyalists in Northern Ireland led by the Reverend Ian Paisley and a real heavy right of Paisley, a guy called William Craig, who led the Vanguard movement, was former Home Affairs Secretary in the Northern Ireland Parliament, a hard man. They led the extreme Protestant group to a massive, and they had wanted nothing to do with the new assembly. They were going to wreck it from within, was their phrase. The unionists led by uh, Brian Faulkner said they would take part on one condition, that the Westminster gave the power over the police and the RUC, uh, particularly the RUC, back to the parliament in Northern Ireland, uh, where it used to belong. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't take part, and Brian Faulkner said he'd resign. So in the interview, long and ranging against a man. I have never known a man as nasty, as cold and as difficult in my life as Edward Heath. Uh, but I did the interview and I got to the point where I said, uh, are you giving the control of the police to this uh, new assembly as the unionists have demanded or they'll uh, uh, not take part? And Brian Ford will resign. And Heath said, no, it's not going back there. We're keeping it in Westminster. There it was, black and white. And then I said, but the loyalists in Northern Ireland and the second time I mentioned loyalists, Ted Heath lost his temper with me and he went red in the face and almost foamed at the mouth and went for me. And I'm a young, naive presenter. It was a bit scary, Dining Street, the Prime Minister, saying, loyalists. He said, loyalists. There are no more disloyal people in the whole of the United Kingdom than people who don't accept the decisions of the sovereign parliament. They are not loyalists, they're disloyal. And I'm there gasping and forever proud of myself for coping with the situation. It was one of the highlights of my entire career. Because I, I said to him, uh, Prime Minister, are you saying that the loyalists, who, who are led by the Reverend Ian Paisley and Mr. William Craig, the most extreme loyalists you could get, uh, Reverend Ian Paisley played the national anthem every moment he could uh, have, waved the Union Jack whenever he could, uh, allegiance to the Queen all the time. I said, are you calling them disloyal? And he knew he couldn't say it. He knew he couldn't say Paisley and Craig were disloyal. And I could see the, the look in his eye, how to get out of this, because it would have caused us a civil war almost. Um, and he said, oh, but we're most spluttering. But what I'm saying is um, the people you refer to as loyalist um, are, no, are the most disloyal people if they don't listen to this parliament accept its decisions. I said, well, they are the people led by Mr. Uh, Paisley and Mr. Craig. They are disloyal, are they? And he again puffed and panted his way around it, wouldn't answer it. But it was the lead in every national newspaper the next day. It was on the news that night. Every news carried it. Disloyal. Uh, Paisley went apoplectic, wrote to, to send a telegram to the Queen, raised it in the House of Parliament the next day on the floor of the Commons, and it made uh, Irish Times carried it verbatim. It made a huge difference to what was going on in Northern Ireland at that time. And Brian Faulkner came on our programme the next night when I went back to Belfast. I said, are you resigning, uh, Brian Faulkner? You saw my interview last night. Are you resigning? Is the Unionist Party now walking away because you're not getting control of the police? And do you know what he said? 
I saw your interview uh, last night, Gordon, and if I may say so, a very good interview it was too. And I'm glad you've asked me this question because it is a very important question and a, a question the people of Northern Ireland have a right to know the answer to. And then he never answered it. He went all around the houses and I couldn't get him to commit uh, to pulling out because he wanted power basically, and he was never going to. Um, so I just wanted to make that point and very quickly the final point that when peace finally came in, uh, I think it was 2007, my dates get hazy, um, uh, there were two ceasefires, uh, but the final one held. But the person who doesn't get the credit for bringing peace to Northern Ireland as much as he should, because it largely goes to Gerry Adams uh, and to a certain extent to Paisley and all so on, it should have gone to John Hume, a brilliant politician, a man who cared deeply about Northern Ireland, a man of peace, uh, led the, eventually led the SDLP, who uh, united Ireland through peaceful means and dialogue. And he was appalled at the bombing and killing that was going on for nearly 30 years. Um, 3,000 deaths, many deeply uh, injured, uh, life-threatening injuries and so on. Horrific, the whole thing. And he thought it was time to end it. And he instituted the uh, Hume Adams talks that I know John is, uh, Tom there is an expert on, uh, a series of talks. Uh, but I remember John telling me about it. Uh, and his whole premise was to sit down Jerry Adams and say, Jerry, the IRA cannot achieve any more than they've done. Uh, all the civil rights, all the discrimination against housing and uh, jobs and all the rest of it, all that's been sorted now, all done. The gerrymandering has been sorted out, etc. You can never have one unionist government ruling this country again. You cannot gain any more unless you think the British government is going to surrender to IRA violence and pull out and say, OK, it's all yours, Ireland. And that you know and I know it'll never happen. And Jerry Adams took that on board, a much long discussion, but he took that on board and he went to sell it to the IRA, which was never going to be easy. But the IRA also were fed up, as were the British Army. They're all war weary. Uh, and in the end, they went for it. And although there's a hiccup in the middle, that's how the peace process began uh, in those Hume Adams talks, of which John Hume should have the highest praise possible. And I wanted to make that point. Um, right. If there are questions at the end, I'll happily answer any about whether there's going to be a United Ireland or a funny thing that happened with Jerry Adams and me. But for now, I shall relax and apologise for overrunning. Thank you. Thank you very much.